Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where we share stories of people conforming to the letter but not the spirit of a request. Thank you friends for subscribing to the channel, and for so many likes. The first story. Couldn't work one day because of train traffic. Foreman told by supervisor he doesn't want us watching trains all day. Next day we held up a very expensive train for two hours to work. The second story. A team with a cool manager, Bob, and a malicious assistant manager, Judith, was left without leadership when Bob celebrated his anniversary in the regional manager. Joe was sick. Judith started to write up employees for ridiculous reasons. The third story. Immigration officer notices the Taiwan visa in the passport and accuses the traveler of lying. After explaining that Taiwan is not a separate country, the officer lets the traveler through. On to the first story. You don't want us inspecting trains all day? Okay, boss. So I work for a heavy equipment contractor. We specialize in railway work with very industry-specific equipment. On this particular job, we were undercutting tunnels, basically digging dirty or worn out ballast from underneath and between railroad ties and putting new ballast in. It took a high rail backhoe for the digging, an excavator on a high tracker cart for removing the reject ballast and bringing in clean ballast, and a tamper for stabilizing the track when we were done. Three operators and a railway foreman were required along with the equipment. Costs got pretty high. Now on the railway you need track time to complete any work on track. The foreman must get track occupancy permits, TOPS, from Radio Traffic Control, RTC, to ensure our protection from getting blasted by trains. You can only do this between trains. They will not stop trains to allow you to work. Trains make way more money than you cost, especially container trains that have a guaranteed shipping date. Trains also cost a lot of money when they're stopped, some close to a million an hour. We had been getting lots of production through the week. Train traffic was in our favor, until it wasn't. It happens. Sometimes you get what we call a train day. Just so much traffic that RTC won't give you a track permit. We had gotten stranded out on track with no way out other than by rail with nine trains in the line, up before we'd get enough track time to get out of there. There was a lot of overtime build on that day. The supervisor called our foreman wondering why we got nothing done that day and worked so late. The foreman told him why and that it was out of our control. He wasn't happy and proceeded to yell at him about how he doesn't want to pay contractors to PK trains all day. To PK a train means to inspect it as it goes by, in case there's something wrong with the train. PK stands for pins and knuckles. It's mandatory that you inspect a passing train and notify the train crew that you've done so. He tells us the next day what happened and says we'll be getting lots of work done today. It didn't click with me until it actually happened. We got a top with an hour of track time attached. We knew that we couldn't get anything done in that time, but the foreman assured us it would be fine. We're contractors, we do as we're told. We start working. As the end of the hour approaches, we're still digging more ballast out of the track. At the state the track is in, it would take at least another hour to make the track passable for trains. We keep digging. A half hour after our clear time was supposed to be. A train is now calling RTC at this time, wondering why they're stopping. And of course, it's one of those very expensive container trains. We're now an hour over our limit and RTC has been trying to get a hold of our foreman over the radio for 30 minutes. That's when we start putting the new ballast in the track and tamping. We were able to get it back together in an hour and clear the track. Total of three hours on track, train stop for nearly two. We just cost the railroad almost a couple million dollars for that train being late and who knows how many trains behind it we slowed down. Needless to say, the supervisor was furious. He called our foreman right as we got clear, wondering why he's getting called about this huge delay. The foreman simply replied with, you told me not to have contractors PK trains all day. It was beautiful. Boss got what he asked for. Contractors not PKing trains all day, but instead he got a couple of million dollars worth of delay on his hands. Be careful what you wish for. I can imagine the boss's face turning red with anger as he got that phone call from the foreman. Next time, the boss will think twice before making demands that could potentially cost the company a fortune. And who knows, maybe the contractors will get a little extra training on how to PK trains, just in case they ever need to do it again. Or not. I'm sure they're fine without it. So next time before you tell your contractors not to do something, make sure you're ready to deal with the consequences. Or just let them do their job and PK those trains all day long. It might just save you some trouble in the long run. The second story is, you don't talk to me, that's fine. You're all suspended. A bit of backstory. When I was at this job, everyone was kind and nice and we were just a great team. We had a chill management team apart from one. 
Let's call her Judith. Judith loved writing people up and making our lives hell. Although she was just an assistant manager, she would always jump at the opportunity to manage the team for a few days. If the main manager is off. Let's call this manager Bob. Bob was an easygoing person. You wouldn't really see him that often, but he was overall chill. Now we could always handle Judith as any complaints and write-ups etc that she processed had to be approved by Bob or the regional manager. Let's call him Joe. Joe was the coolest guy ever. He was super effing rich too. His wife is a realtor at a massive company. She was the COO, chief operating officer at it, and she was super nice too. Back to Joe. He wasn't just a chill manager, he was also a really great guy. He would bring us all out for beer, department with 30 plus people, on someone's birthday and would approve basically any vacation requests, if you were on the right side of him, and overall he was just a lovely boss. Now my job was a pretty important tech job. I was in a sub department with 4 to 5 people. We made sure that the major systems, product inventory system, POS system, website etc, were up and running, and we controlled the servers that were connected to them all. What we didn't manage was the employee systems, email ticketing, employee portal, etc. That was another sub department. Now, as I was saying, we could handle Judith because basically none of her SH write-ups and complaints got listened to by Bob or Joe. Now on this particular month, Bob was celebrating his 35th anniversary and Joe was sick in hospital. Worst timing, I know. We all mentally prepared ourselves for Judith's wrath. This time we were informed by Bob that any write-up Department change or complaint didn't have to be approved by them as Joe was also gone. We thought no big deal and we'll just get Bob to clear them when we come back. On to the story. We're gonna take it day by day. Day 1. Judith was camping at the door. Anyone who was in after 9am was written up. I was luckily in there at 9 on the dot. So was everyone else since we were used to Judith's shenanigans by now. I was talking to my buddy in the main software and tech department. He told me she was in there all day focusing on this one guy. Let's call him George. I knew George quite well. He was a family friend and for some reason Judith never liked him. She wrote him up five times for SH reasons like on cell phone during working time, making work environment unsanitary and unsafe for other employees. He left an empty plastic bottle on his desk for about an hour, etc. Did I mention he was Joe's son? Day 2. Judith was in our department today, focusing on my colleague. Let's call her Michelle. Michelle is the sweetest person in the world and would never do anything to hurt or ruin anything of anyone's, and she's just a genuine and sweet person. Judith found nothing, and when Judith confronted Michelle, she said she didn't know what she wanted, and Judith filed a complaint for back chat. Judith then hosted a department-wide meeting, so main tech software and the seven sub-departments. She told us that we need to stop being so rude to her because she's a woman, blah blah blah. That night I send a message onto the management free group with everyone from the department, saying not to engage with Judith. We can't get written up by her for rudeness or disrespect if we don't talk to her. Day 3. Q Malicious Compliance On day 3 we all come in. The day starts as usual. We all come in at the right time so Judith had no one to write up. We head to our departments and begin work as usual. Judith wasn't focused on someone from my department so lucky us. At about midday, we hear Judith going ape sh at someone from the department that managed the employee systems because they weren't talking to her. She kept going on and on at him but still no response. Finally, Judith gave him one last chance before announcing the entire department. is being suspended for sexism and disrespect. Our room was next to their one so we heard everything crystal clear. Then to Judith's surprise, everyone gathers their things and leaves without a word. I didn't get to see the look on her face but I bet she was livid. Then she moved on to my department. She came in and told us we have to do all the work for the other department as they're all suspended. And to her dismay, no one batted an eye at her. Out of the corner of my eye I could see her face going dark red, until she got up on a chair and started screaming at us all, then counting down from 10. All of us knew what was coming so we slowly began to log out of our things and pack up, without being too obvious. By the time she got to 1 we were all ready to leave. Can you guess what was coming? If you said you're all suspended you would be correct. We then left. I messaged one of my buddies in the other departments and she did the exact same thing to his department. Turns out she did it to 5 out of 6 departments. The one she left was the least useful department, customer services. Yes, it's an important one, but not nearly as important as financial development, etc. Day 4. None of us went in, bar customer services, until we got a message from Bob asking why none of us are in work. It was the day he came back. We told him we were all suspended. He asked why and we told him the genuine reason. He was absolutely furious at Judith and proceeded to call us all in for a staff meeting. It was really front row tickets to Judith's downfall. He proceeded to criticize her for all her false write-ups, 
accusations, and how she's done barely any of the roles that the assistant manager should be doing. He then fired her. Bob made us turn all the systems onto auto mode and gave us Friday off. What an awesome man. NB. Joe got out of hospital but sadly passed a few months later from cancer of the liver. I have since left the company and have no real info of what happened after the death. Edit. I forgot to mention that Judith costed the company almost 50k, as some of our vital systems went down in the 6 hours they were left without being switched onto auto mode. The company almost sued her for this but they decided firing her would be better as they would be done with her. Judith is having a hard time managing the team. If you're writing up people for leaving an empty bottle on their desk, you may as well write up the dust on the keyboard. I guess she was just trying to show who's boss, but it backfired. Maybe she should have tried something different, like offering cookies or ice cream to the team. I'm sure that would have lifted their spirits and made them more productive. But instead, Judith decided to count down from 10, like a teacher trying to control a rowdy classroom. Unfortunately for her, she wasn't in a classroom, and the employees weren't children. Maybe next time, Judith will learn to treat her team with respect, and they'll treat her with respect in return. Or she could keep counting down from 10, and the team will keep walking out. Either way, it's going to be an interesting ride. The last story is... Diplomatically Compliant Many years ago, I lived in southern China, right on the mainland, but close enough to Hong Kong and Macau to easily go there regularly. China, then maybe 15 years ago, as it is now, is full of official stances on all sorts of topics and situations. These stances are more often than not of the close your eyes and tell it until it's true type, meaning that even though everyone on earth can see otherwise, you stick to the policy or get in trouble. Sometimes, as a non-Chinese person, it's really tedious and mind-breaking to bend to these whims. It's not that I'm more enlightened. Chinese people for the most part understand the reality of the situation, but have inexhaustible strength to plow on ahead through the BS. Much stronger than I. Perhaps the most ridiculous example is the One China policy, which dictates that Taiwan is a part of mainland China. No matter if it's ruled by their opponents in the Civil War, they issue their own stamps, currency, add passports, and act in every possible way as a country rather than a province. So you have to be really careful when you have to navigate the high seas of BS when it comes to Taiwan. When you enter China, you have to fill out these little cards with all your information. Notably, list all foreign countries you visited in the past 14 days. Now I took a trip to Taiwan, had a blast and was flying back via Hong Kong. I made it to the border crossing into mainland China, Shenzhen. There are thousands of people all lined up in lines for foreigners, Chinese citizens, HK and Macau residents, and Taiwanese compatriots. So I, being American, grab my little card and stand in the foreigner line and start filling out my info. HK is in a separate country, and neither is Taiwan, so I technically didn't go anywhere outside of the country. I left the places you've been field blank. I get to the counter and the immigration officer looks at my card, and then flips through my passport, where he notices an exit stamp from just a few hours ago from Taiwan. He gets annoyed and asks me why I was lying on my card, and how declaring false information is punishable by jail time, and then permanent expulsion. I asked him what I was lying about. I honestly wasn't thinking about it. I was thinking I misspelled my name or something. He says, you've not been anywhere but you have a Taiwanese visa in your passport? To which I replied, oh, this asks me what countries I've visited. I've only been to Taiwan. Realizing his error, he looks around to see if anybody else heard him, then stamps my passport and waves me through. Looks like someone forgot to check their geography. I guess this guy learned that when it comes to filling out official forms, Honesty is not always the best policy. Or maybe he just needs to brush up on his geography skills. Either way, it's a good thing he didn't end up in Chinese jail for his little mistake. I hope you enjoyed these stories. Hit the like button and subscribe to the channel.